Hello everybody and welcome to another YouTube video. So in today's video, I am going to be showing you how to create a sorting algorithm visualizer in Python using Pygame. Now I have the demo in front of me, so let me show you exactly what the finished product will look like. And then I'll talk about some prerequisites and we'll get into the code. All right, so this is the program. You can see right now we're going to be looking at the bubble sort algorithm in ascending order. And if I hit space, we can actually view the visualization. Now, there is ways to speed up this visualization. Right now, I just have it on kind of a default setting so that you can actually view what's going on. But of course, if I want to, I can reset. So this would just give me a new starting list here to actually sort. I can change the algorithm that I want to view. So in this case, I'll go to insertion sort. And now we can see that, you know, obviously something different is happening. And then if I want to, I can change from ascending order to descending order. So once this is done, I'll be able to do that right now. I can't because uh, what do you call it? We're in the middle of a sort. Anyways, if I stop this by resetting and now I change this to uh, sorry, ascending order or descending order, whatever it is, you can see that we'll go in the opposite direction. Well, that's kind of how this program works. Now, I'm only going to show you how to implement insertion sort and bubble sort. But the way I've written this code is that it's going to be very easy to plug in pretty much any other sorting algorithm that you want. You will have to do some manual changes and figure a few things out. But if you wanted to visualize, say, heap sort or some other type of algorithm, you just have to write that sorting algorithm, make it so it draws the different steps. And well, this program would work for you. All right. So with that said, let's talk about a few prerequisites before going through all of this code in this long tutorial. And then, of course, I'll show you how to build this. So the first thing I'll state is that this tutorial is not designed for beginners. I'm going to assume you have some familiarity with Python and with programming in general. I'm going to be showing things like object oriented programming functions. I'm actually going to show you a generator as well, although I'll explain that when we get to that part. But if you are not familiar with Python and you want to follow along with this, then you should check out programming expert.io from the link in the description. Now, Programming Expert is the best platform to learn how to code. If you had gone through that content, you would have learned literally everything you need to know to follow along with this tutorial and hundreds of others that are for intermediate programmers on my channel. Anyways, check it out from the link in the description. You can use the code Tim for a discount on the platform. Other than that, we're going to be using Pygame here. Pygame will be for the visuals. You don't have to know Pygame. I will explain to you the few features that we use as we go through the code. So with that said, let me head over to Sublime Text and we can actually start implementing this project. All right, so I'm in Sublime Text. This is the code editor I'm going to use for this video. You can use any editor that you would like. And I have Python version 3.9 installed as well as Pygame. Now you can use any version of Python above 3.6. Now the first step here is going to be to install Pygame. If you don't already have it installed, then you can go to your command prompt or your terminal and simply type in pip install Pygame. If that doesn't work for you, I will leave two videos on the screen that show you how to install Pygame, one for Mac and one for Windows. Once we have Pygame installed, though, let's go into our Python code file. Just notice I have mine called tutorial.py and let's import Pygame. Let's import the random module. I'm going to use this to generate the starting list uh, when we actually want to sort something. Right. And then I'm just going to say Pygame dot init. All right. So the first thing we can do here is we can set up our Pygame window and a few kind of global constants that we want to have access to throughout the entirety of the program. So what I could do here is define maybe like 20 or 30 global variables, stuff like different colors, stuff like the window size, width, height, all of that. But that means that when I'm accessing these values in functions, I'm going to be accessing a global value. And I don't like using global variables because that means any of the functions that I write here, I can't port them over to another program if they're using something from the global scope. So instead, what I'm going to do is set up a class. I'm going to call this class game information or I guess not game information. I guess it would be uh, something like drawing information. And I'm going to put all of the stuff in here in this class that I want to have as kind of global values to be accessed. You'll see what I mean in a second. But for now, let's create a class. and I'm going to call this. Uh, what do we want to call this draw and then information like that. Now, the idea here is we'll instantiate this class at the beginning of our program and pass to it stuff like the width, the height, the starting list. It will then store all of those values as well as any additional values that we need. And then we can just pass this instance to all of the different functions that need it and it can access all of this information. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just to find a bunch of colors. So I'm going to say black is equal to zero, zero, zero. I'm going to say white is equal to 255, 255, 255. These are in RGB, so red, green, blue. 
obviously the maximum value is 255. We're also going to want green. So I'm going to say green is equal to 0, 255, and then 0. We'll want red. This is going to be equal to 0, uh, or sorry, 255, 0, and 0. I want a gray. This will be equal to 128, 128, and 128. And then I want my background underscore color. So let's do this. If I could get the autocomplete background color to be equal to white. OK, so notice I'm defining all of these kind of global values as class attributes. That just means they're defined directly in the class body as opposed to a constructor. OK, so those are all I need for right now. I will define a few more in a second. And by the way, if you see me looking over here to kind of the right of my screen, that's because I'm referencing the code that I already wrote. Obviously, I don't have all of this memorized. OK, so now that we have all of our colors defined, these are what we're going to use for our different rectangles and the bars and the text and all of that. I want to define an initialization. And this initialization here is going to take in a width, a height, and then a list, which will be LST. Now, this list is going to be the starting list that we actually want to sort. And we're going to store that inside of this uh, instance. So I'm going to say self.width is equal to width. I'm going to say self height is equal to height. And then I will actually set up a few other attributes in here that we're going to need. So the first additional attribute I'm going to add here is going to be the window. So whenever we're working with Pygame, we need to set up a screen or a window that we're going to draw everything on. Now we need to access that pretty much everywhere in the program. So I'm going to put that as an attribute on the class so that it's very easy to access. So I'm going to say self dot window is equal to Pygame dot display dot set underscore mode. And then I'm going to pass as a tuple here, the width and the height. So whenever you create a window in Pygame, this is how you do it. Say a Pygame dot display dot set underscore mode, pass the width and the height as a tuple. And we will set the width and the height in a second when we actually initialize uh, this instance. OK, then I want to set a caption for this window. So I'm going to say uh, Pygame dot display dot set underscore caption, not a capital, but caption like that. And then I can say sorting algorithm and then visualization or visualizer, whatever you want to call it. But this will be kind of the name of the window. And then after that, I'm going to call a new method that I'm going to define called set underscore list and pass this LST. So now I'm going to go and make a method. I'm going to say define. This is going to be called set underscore list. This is going to take in self if I could type properly as well as LST. And what we're going to do here is set a bunch of attributes that we need related to the list. So now I want to talk about how we're actually going to create kind of the visualization. So you saw that I had a bunch of bars on the screen. In fact, let me just run the other program here because this will give us a good visualization. OK, so you can see I have a bunch of different bars here, right? Now, first of all, I have these bars in three different colors just so that they're easy to see. I kind of have a dark gray lighter gray and then the lightest gray, right? So I have three different colors. Now, all of these bars have a specific width and a specific height. However, the width of these bars is going to depend on how many of them I have. For example, if I go to my other program here, just bear with me for one second, and I change the number of values that I have to say 25 as opposed to 100, because previously I had 100, notice how we're going to have bars that are uh, a little bit wider, right? So we need our bars to adjust based on the number of values in our list. And then same thing with the height of our bars. The height of our bars is going to be determined by the range of values in our list. So if we have a range of, say, one to 100, then each one pixel or each value one is going to be represented by four or five pixels. Right. Whereas if we have a range of one to a thousand, then maybe the value one is only represented by 0.5 pixels. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. But the idea is we want this to be dynamic. So we need to kind of calculate the width of all of these bars and what the height of one individual kind of unit, one number will be based on the range of values we have within our bars. OK, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, uh, but that's what I'm going to attempt to do now. So the first thing I'm going to do in here is just say self.lst is equal to LST because I just want to store this list internally. I'm then going to say self dot and this is going to be max underscore value is equal to the maximum of the list. This is going to give me the maximum number in there and I'll say self dot min underscore value is equal to the min in the list. And just because I think it makes sense to do this, we're going to put the min before the max. OK, great. So now that we have this, the first thing I want to do 
is calculate the width of every one of our bars. Now, the width of these bars will be determined by how many of them we have and the width of our screen. And in fact, if I run this one more time, you'll see here that we actually have kind of a padding on the left and the right hand side. So we want to include that in the calculation as well. If we want to have, say, 100 pixels from the left or right hand side so that the bars are kind of in the center and they don't look like they're kind of touching the edge of the screen. Hopefully you see what I mean, but essentially we have a little bit of padding and that's kind of what I'm talking about. You can see the padding is maintained when I reset this. So let's now implement one more variable here. I'm going to call this the uh, I got to go look at my cheat sheet to make sure I don't mess this up. I'm going to call this the side pad and the side pad is going to be equal to 100 pixels. Now, what this is going to tell me is I want 100 pixels in total as the padding from the left and the right hand side. So 50 pixels on the left and fix 50 pixels on the right. OK, so what I'm going to do here is say self dot and then this is going to be pixel underscore width. And really, this should be like block width or something. But for now, I'll just go with pixel width. Uh, kind of a weird name, but that's what I did in my other sheet. So just so I don't mess myself up, we'll go with that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the self dot width and I am going to divide that or sorry. First of all, I'm going to subtract that from my self dot side pad. OK, so let's go self dot side pad. And then I'm going to divide that by the length of my list. So I need to put parentheses here. But let's talk about why we're doing this. So we have the width of our screen, which is, say, 500 pixels or something like that. And then we have a side padding. And in this case, I've made it 100. Now, this is the total amount of padding, including the left and the right hand side. So I want to determine how wide my pixels should be based on how much area I'm going to have to put them in and uh, the length of the number of kind of blocks that I'm going to need. And in fact, you know what? Let's just call this block width because pixel width is really throwing me off. That's a very poor name. OK, so we have block width. So I'm taking the self dot width, dividing it by the self dot side pad. And that's going to tell me the total area I actually have to represent each of my blocks in. So then I'm going to take whatever my total kind of drawable area is and divide it by the length of my list, which is the number of blocks that I have. Now, I'm just going to round this value because we can't draw like fractional amounts. Uh, so I just want to round that to whatever the nearest decimal is. OK, that's great for the block width. Now. For the block height, this is going to represent the height of one kind of unit of a block. This is really weird to explain, but let's say we have the number 100. Essentially, I want to multiply this by the block height to determine how high 100 should be, right? How large should that be on the screen? And this is going to depend on the largest number in my list and the smallest number on my list. Because again, if say the largest number is 10,000, then 100 is going to be quite small. But if the largest number is 100, then this is going to be the maximum possible height. Hopefully that makes sense. But that's what this next calculation is going to do, uh, which is a little bit complicated. So I'm going to say the self dot height. Then this is going to be minus the self dot top underscore pad. And the top pad is going to be the padding that we're going to have to allow us to draw like the controls and some of the text at the top of the screen. So I'm going to implement my top pad now. I'm going to say top pad is equal to. And for now, we'll go with 150 pixels. We can always modify this later on. OK, so we're going to have the self dot height minus the self dot top pad. This is going to tell us again the total drawable area that we have. And then what we're going to do is divide this by the self dot max value minus the self dot min value. And we're going to round all of this. So let's round all of this in parentheses. So the reason I'm doing this is the maximum value minus the minimum value is going to tell me the number of values in my range. So if the minimum value is one and the maximum value is 100, then the range of numbers I have is 99, right? I have 99 distinct numbers. Whereas if we have something like 1,000 and maybe negative 10,000, I'm going to have a lot much larger range. And so the height of kind of one unit is going to be a lot smaller. Again, hopefully that makes sense, but that's kind of what this calculation is doing. OK, now the last thing I'm going to do is say that the self dot start underscore X. So this is where I'm going to start drawing my blocks for the X coordinate is going to be equal to. And then this will be uh, the self dot side pad integer divided by two just to make sure I get a whole number. Now, just to quickly explain the coordinate sister system of Pi game in case you're unfamiliar, let me load the screen back up. The top left hand corner of the screen is zero zero. So as you go down, the Y increases and as you go to the right, the X increases. So when I say something like start at self dot side pad over two, that's telling me to start kind of right here where this block is starting. Right. Hopefully that makes sense. 
OK, so there we go. We are almost finished the draw information class. Uh, there's a few other things we need to add, but for now, I think this is fine. And I'm just double checking to make sure we didn't mess anything up. Looks good so far. OK, so now that we have this class, the next thing I want to do is write a function that's going to generate the starting list for us because we need a starting list to actually sort and we'll be able to determine uh, you know, how many elements we want in the list and what the range of the elements is. So I'm going to create a function. I'm going to call this generate uh, starting underscore list. OK, and this will take in N and then min and max. And I'll just make these val so they don't shadow the min and max function. OK, so N will be the number of elements that we want in our starting list. Min will be the minimum possible value and max will be the maximum possible value. And we'll just randomly generate a list. here. So I'm just going to say LST is equal to that. And I'll say four underscore in range n. So just do this n times essentially. Then I'm going to generate a random value. So I'm going to say value is equal to random dot rand int. And I'm going to put this between the min value and the max value. And this will give me a number within this range inclusively, meaning it will include both the minimum and maximum value as possible values to generate. OK, then I'm going to say LST dot append value like that. And if I wanted to, I could shuffle this list, but this will already give me a random list of values. So what I can do here is just return LST. Great. Now we have our starting list generate. Now that we've done that, I actually want to put something on the screen. I want to see my window. So I'm going to implement a function which is going to be kind of our main driver code, which I'll call me. So I'm going to say define main. And then inside of here, what we're going to do is we're actually going to render the screen. We're going to set up our main event loop, which is going to allow us to press buttons, click the X button, all of that kind of stuff. And then we'll start drawing our list onto the screen. That will be the next step. So for now, what I'm going to do is say that run is equal to true. This is just going to be a variable for my while loop. I'm going to say while run like that. And inside of here, I'm going to set up my pie game event loop. So whenever you implement something in Pygame, you need a loop constantly running in the background, because if you don't have that, then you'll just say draw something on the screen and the program will immediately end. So I need a loop that's going to be handling all of the events that are occurring, like me attempting to start sorting, right? Or changing from descending order to ascending order or trying to exit the program, whatever. We need a loop to handle that. So this is going to be my loop right here. And one thing that we can do inside of our loop is we can put something called a clock, which will regulate how quickly this loop can run. So I'm going to say clock is equal to pi game dot time dot and then with a capital C like that clock. So I'll explain the clock in a second. But let's go clock dot tick. I'm going to put 60. 60 would be our FPS. So this is the maximum number of times that this loop can run per second. Right now, I'm going to make it 60. You could, of course, increase this to whatever you want, but we'll just go with a hard code of 60 for right now. And now I'm going to do my kind of handling of events. So I'm going to say for event in and then pygame.event.get. This is going to return to us a list of all of the events that have occurred since the last loop. So since the last time this was called, it'll give it give it to us in the event variable. And then we can check the event variable for specific events. So I can do something like if event uh, is equal to pygame dot quit with all capitals. Make sure it's all capitals. Then I can say run is equal to false. And then at the end of this while loop here, I can say pygame dot quit. So as soon as we break out of this while loop, we will then end the pygame program. Perfect. Now, one thing I want to do in here, though, is I want to actually draw the window and show that on the screen. So all I'm going to do is say pygame dot display dot update. And when you do this, it will update the display. Now, right now we haven't drawn anything onto this display, so we're not going to see that when I call update, it will just render the display. So we'll actually see it uh, and then we can continue from there. OK, uh, last thing I want to do here is just say if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals underscore underscore main underscore underscore, then I want to call the main function. Now, this is just going to make sure that we actually are running this module by clicking the run button or running this module directly before we call the main function. If we were to import this module, this line would not run. But if we actually run this module directly, then we run the main function. OK, and just to go over something that I don't think I mentioned this right here. So if event equals pi game dot quit, essentially that is hitting the red X in the top right hand corner. So you need to manually handle that. If you click the X and you don't have this, it's not going to do anything. So you always want to implement this first to make sure you can actually quit the game. OK. 
So there we go. We've written a good amount of code already. What I'm going to do now is run this code uh, and display mode not set. Oh, OK. So this is an interesting error to run into. So I'm getting a problem here. It's saying display mode not set because I've not yet instantiated my window, right? Remember, I told you we need a window or a screen to actually draw on. So before I can update the window, I need to create it. And to create it, I'm going to have to instantiate this draw information class. So I'm going to go to the top here and I'm going to say draw underscore info is equal to draw information. And then what do I need to pass here? Well, I need to pass a width, a height and an LST. So let's decide on our width and height. For now, I'm going to go with 800, 600. If this is too big for your screen, then make it a little bit smaller. But this should be a good size to start with. And then I need to pass a list. Now, for the list, I'm just going to say LST is equal to create starting list. And I'm going to pick my values here. Now, it'd be helpful to put them in a variable so I can change them very easily later. So I'm going to say N is equal to 50. Uh, I'm going to say min val is equal to let's go with zero and let's go max val is equal to 100. And then we're going to pass N min val and max val. Now, one thing to notice here is I'm doing everything very dynamically. I'm using lots of variables and I'm making sure that if I change one or two values, the entire program will update to represent that. Right. That's why I'm putting everything in variables, just so it's really easy for me to see where I can change something. And so that if I ever have to reuse these variables, which we will actually in a second, I don't have to hard code the same thing multiple times. OK, now inside of draw info, I'm going to pass LST as the last argument. And now we should actually be good to run this and hopefully see a screen showing up. So let me run this and create starting list is not defined. Uh, did I not define that? Uh, oh, sorry. Generate starting list is what that's called. So let's change this to generate. I mean, generate, create pretty much the same thing. Let's run. And there we go. OK, so we get a window. It says sorting algorithm visualization. And obviously nothing's showing up because we haven't drawn anything. So now it is time to draw something. And actually, it looks like the X button is not working. Uh, so let me tell you why it's not working, because I see the error. So to close this, I'm going to have to manually close it. Uh, I think I can do control C or control alt C. What was my button to break this? I got to figure this out. Tools, uh, cancel build, control shift C. OK, that's how I cancel my build in Sublime. Anyways, the reason this is happening is because I forgot to add my type here. So you have to say if event.type is equal to pygame.quit, not just event. Event uh, has the type property on it, so you have to access that first. OK, let's just try this one more time to make sure I didn't mess anything up. Let's click X, closes the program. Awesome. We can now actually draw the list. OK, so to draw the list, I want to write a function. In fact, I want to write two functions, one function that's responsible for just drawing the general screen and the second function that's responsible for actually drawing the list, right? The thing that we're going to be sort. So I'm going to do a function. Doesn't really matter where I put it. And I'm just going to call this draw. And what this is going to take in is draw info. OK, so we're going to take in draw info. And then what we're going to do is fill the screen with the background color of our screen. So I'll explain this in a second. And then after that, we'll update the display and then we will draw the list. So for now, I'm going to say draw info dot window. So I'm accessing my window here and then I'm going to say dot fill. And what dot fill takes is a color and it will fill the entire screen with this color. Now, in Pygame, the way that drawing works is you draw a bunch of stuff onto the screen. And then as soon as you want to apply that drawing and actually see it, you update the display. So what you do first Usually, at least this is what I do. I fill the entire screen with a color to kind of get rid of any of the previous drawing that would have occurred. So it's overriding everything on the screen. Then I draw a bunch of stuff, then I update it. And then the next time I draw, I clear everything, redraw it again and continue. This is not the most efficient way to do things, but it makes it so that if you kind of were drawing a bunch of stuff, you're not seeing overlays or shadows or multiple things on the screen when you shouldn't see that. You're just redrawing the entire canvas every single frame. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. We will see this in a second. But for now, I'm going to say that I want to do this with the draw info dot background color, right? Because I put background color as a class attribute right here. It's equal to white. White's this. So now I'm going to fill the screen with whatever the background color is. And that way, if I want to change the background color, I just go here, change one attribute and we're done. OK, now that I've done that, I want to update directly in here. So I'm going to say pygame dot display dot update. OK, so let's just call the draw function and make sure that works. And then we'll draw the list. 
So I'm going to go to main and now right under my clock dot tick, I'm just going to say draw and I'll pass draw info, which is an instance of the draw information class. Great. OK, now what I can do is run the code and let's see if it's white. There we go. We now have a white background. Awesome. We can now close. OK, so now that we've done that, we want to draw the list. Now I'm going to put drawing the list in a separate function because we're going to do some more drawing stuff in here. But drawing the list is kind of a separate thing, right? So I'm going to say define draw list like that. I'm going to take and draw info. And for now, I think that's actually all we need. Now, this is a little bit complicated here, drawing the list. I will explain, obviously, as I go through. But we have to look at every single element in our list. We have to determine the height of that element and the X coordinate of that element and then draw a rectangle representing it. And we also want to make sure that we're drawing all of these rectangles in a slightly different color. So a different gray, right? So we can actually see them because if we don't draw them in a different color, it's just going to be all kind of squished together. So now what I want to do is add the three different colors for my uh, what do you call it? Blocks, rectangles, whatever. So let's go to draw information and let's create something called gradient. Uh, I think that's how you spell gradient. I'm going to do gradients. Now, this is just going to store three colors, which are going to be kind of my gray gradients. Now, I don't think they're really gradients. I could probably call them grays, but I went with gradients. So we're going to keep them. So for now, the first one will just be gray. And then the next one is going to be one. And let me look at my cheat sheet here. OK, 160, 160 and 160. And then the last one will be 192, 192, 192. Now, I also could put these in variables and call them like dark gray, light gray, medium gray, whatever. For now, we'll just do this. In fact, it's probably going to make sense to just get rid of gray, actually, and just manually hard code it in because there's not really a point to me having one of those as a variable, uh, but not the others. OK, so there we go. These are our gray gradients. And now I can use these when I'm actually drawing my rectangles. OK. So now let's go inside of draw list. And what I'm going to do is iterate over my list. So I'm just going to say that LST is equal to draw info dot LST, just so I don't have to keep writing out draw info dot LST. And I'm going to say for I val in enumerate LST. Now enumerate is going to give me the index as well as the value of every single element in my list. So this will be good to use when looping through. Now what I need to do is calculate the X coordinate and the Y coordinate for the top left hand corner of this rectangle, because when we draw a rectangle in Python, we draw it from the top left hand corner. Then we draw it down and to the right, depending on the height and the width. OK, we also need to calculate the color because we're going to have a different gray color depending on what rectangle we're drawing. So I'm going to say X is equal to and then this is going to be draw info dot start underscore X this is the starting X position plus and then this is going to be I multiplied by and then the draw info dot and this is going to be the block width. I think that's actually good for X uh, that will tell us where we want to draw uh, our block. And if I is zero, so it's the very first block, then that means we're going to draw it exactly at the starting X position, which is what we want. Perfect. Now we're going to do Y. Now Y is going to be at uh, this is actually going to be the value multiplied by the draw info dot. And then this is going to be the block height. However, I need to offset this by a certain amount. So actually, let me load up the program again and just talk about this because it's this a bit more complicated than I remember. So what we need to do here is we need to draw the taller rectangles higher on the screen, right? So you can see this guy is obviously higher than this guy. Now we start drawing from the top left hand corner, which means I need to draw from a higher Y coordinate, meaning like a lower Y coordinate value because Y zero is up here. So Y say 200 is where my mouse is, right? So I need to kind of do the reverse of what is intuitive here. I'm going to figure out what the height of this rectangle needs to be. And then I'm going to subtract that from the height of the screen. And that will tell me the starting coordinate. So then I draw it downwards starting from there. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but uh, this is going to be a bit different than what I wrote out here. In fact, it's going to be completely different. So what I'm going to do here is write draw underscore info dot height. So the height of the screen and then I'm going to subtract that from and then this is going to be a little bit different here. I'm going to take this outside of the parentheses and I'm going to say this is going to be the value minus and then this is going to be the draw info dot minimum value. 
So the reason for this is that I can't just use the value itself to actually determine the height of the rectangle. The reason I can't do that is because we have a range of values we could potentially have. In fact, we could have a range of like negative 100 to zero. And if that's the range that we have and I just multiply my value by my draw info dot block height, I'm going to get a negative amount and it's going to give me like a ridiculously high size for the smallest value. So we need to actually take whatever our value is and subtract it from the minimum value to determine how much larger it is than the minimum, because the minimum is going to be represented as a height of zero or as a height of one. I forget exactly how it's going to be. But the idea is we'll subtract the minimum value that tells us how much larger we are than the minimum. And then we multiply that by the block height and that will give us the correct height. Hopefully that makes sense. But that's really the best explanation I can give you uh, next. What we're going to do, we just got to look at my code over here is we're going to determine the color that we want to draw with. So I'm going to say the color is equal to and this is going to be the draw info dot gradients. And then this is going to be at I mod three. Now we have three elements inside of gradients, which means we have the indices zero, one and two. So when I take the division or the remainder after division of three, this is always going to give me zero, one or two. And all of the elements beside each other will have a different mod three. Right. So like element at position one, two and three are going to have different values for I mod three. And so that's going to allow me to have all three of the elements that are beside each other having a different color. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but essentially every three elements we're going to reset and we'll go back to the original gray. But for those three elements, we'll have the light gray, medium gray and then the dark gray. Then we'll reset and continue. That's what I mod three will do. Now that we've done that, we can actually draw this onto the screen. So I'm going to say pi game dot draw dot rect. This is how you draw a rectangle. I'm going to pass the uh, position or sorry, screen where I want to draw this. I'm going to say draw info dot window. I'm going to pass the color, which is going to be this. And then I'm going to pass my rectangle, which is going to be X, Y. This is then going to be the block width. So draw info dot block width and then draw info dot block height is correct, but we're going to need to determine how high this block actually is so that we know how far down to draw, right? Because we figured out the top left hand corner position, but now we need to figure out how much downwards we want to draw. Now we could really just do this. We could just do height. And in fact, that will work because if anything, we'll draw off the screen, but we will always fill down to the bottom of the screen. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Like if the height of our block is 300, then we can just draw a height of 500 because if we draw 200 over, it just won't show up because it's going to be beneath the screen. So I'm just going to be lazy and go with that for now. You could calculate the precise height using the value, uh, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm just going to do this. OK, so I think that's going to be good uh, for now. Yeah, that should actually be good. We can just draw the list like that. So now what I'm going to do is inside of the draw function after I clear the screen, I'm going to draw the list. So let's go draw list. Let's pass draw info like that. And then we'll update the display here. And fingers crossed, we should be seeing the list showing up on the screen now if I run the code. OK, so let's go ahead and do this. And let's see what we get. And it says block width is not defined. Uh, OK, so let's see where I did block width. Uh, oops, I need to do draw underscore info dot block width when I am drawing my rectangle. OK, so make that fix and hopefully we should be good now. Let's try this. And there we go. We can see we have all of our rectangles showing up. And let me just run this a few times and show you that it's going to work for different values, right? Because I'm randomly generating the values when we initialize this. So we should be getting slightly different sizes for our stacks or blocks or whatever you want to call them. OK, perfect. That is looking good to me. Now what I want to do is just implement the ability to reset the stack size just so that we can go through a bunch of different options and check to make sure that that's working. So I am going to now uh, implement a key press for the R key on your keyboard. So when you click that, it will then reset the uh, the list. OK, so I'm going to say if and then this will be uh, pi game dot event is equal to pi game dot key down. And I'm actually going to say if this is not equal to key down, then continue. So if we're not pressing any key down, we're going to continue, which just means we're going to go to the next event in the for loop. Otherwise, though, so if we do get past this, it means we did have a key down. I'm going to say if pi game dot event dot key is equal to pi game dot capital K underscore R. 
Uh, you kind of have to look them up for all of the different keys, but this will give you R. If you wanted A, it would be like K underscore A. If you wanted space, it'd be K underscore space with all capitals on the space. Uh, for all the letters, it's usually just the lowercase letter. So in this case, we'll just go with R. And now what I will do is I'm just going to reset the list. So I'm going to say that LST is equal to this. So we'll say LST is equal to generate starting list and min val and max val. Notice why I put these variables here now so that we can reuse them again. And then I need to set the list on my draw info class. So I'm going to say draw info dot set list and then pass LST because remember draw info is storing this list. So we need to reset it on the draw info class. Otherwise, it's not going to update when we're actually drawing because look, all we're passing is draw info, right? So now when I press R, it should actually reset this. So let's run the code and let's see if that's the case. OK, so when I click R, uh, it doesn't seem to be working. So let me see what I uh, messed up here and then I'll be right back. All right. So for some reason, I decided to put a preface of Pi game before my events. Uh, we don't need to do that. We do need them here before key down in K underscore R, but I don't need Pi game dot event because I just want to access the event variable. So that's the issue I was having. So I'm going to remove those and hopefully now this should be good. OK, so let me try. And OK, it still doesn't seem to be working. So let me have a look and I will be right back. All right. Another silly mistake here. I really should just look at my code because I'm trying to do this off the top of my head. But I need to add a dot type here. So I was saying if event is equal to pi game dot key down, I can't do that. I need to do dot type just like I did here. Now, hopefully this should work. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Let's run the code. Let's hit R. And then there we go. We can see we're getting many different stack sizes showing up on the screen. Exactly what I wanted. Perfect. OK, so now that we have that, really what we can do is actually implement the sorting algorithm itself uh, and then start actually kind of drawing the steps in the sorting algorithm. That's going to be the most complicated part. But we've got kind of the main, I guess, foundation done for this application. And really all we need to do is make it so now we can draw what's happening in the sorting algorithm, which of course involves implementing the sorting algorithm itself. So the first thing I'm going to do here is implement a key press for space so that when you hit the space key, it actually allows you to start sorting and then we'll implement the sorting algorithm. So just like I did here, I'll actually copy this. I'm going to say elif because if it wasn't that key R, then we'll check if it's something else. So elif event key is equal to pi game dot key underscore space because this is how we're going to start sorting. Then what I want to do is just set a variable here. I'm going to say sorting is equal to true. OK, so I'm going to go up to the top of my program. I'm going to say sorting is equal to false. And then this will kind of tell us, OK, are we sorting? Are we not sorting? And I'm also going to add something here that says and sorting is equal to false double equals uh, to make sure that we can't start sorting if we're already sorting. Right. Whereas if we want to reset, that's fine. We can reset if we're currently sorting. Uh, in this case, we'll actually say sorting is equal to false. So if we do reset what's on our screen, then we want to stop sorting because we would have changed the list. So we'll say sorting equals false. OK, that's really all we need for that. Uh, the next thing I will implement is ascending or descending. So I'm going to say ascending is equal to true. And then I'll implement the key presses to toggle ascending or descending. So if you hit A, it will be ascending. If you hit D, it will be descending. So let's copy this. Let's go here. We'll just say elif event dot key is equal to pi game dot k underscore a. Then we'll just set ascending equal to true. So we'll say ascending equal to true like that. And then we can go here, say elif event dot key equals k underscore d. Then ascending is equal to false. And I'll just make sure that we can't do this while we're sorting. So I'll say and not sorting and not sorting. OK. Nice. <laughs> now, I actually uh, want to wait till the very end to do the sorting algorithm part. I just want to draw on the screen the different controls. So I'll show you what this looks like. But if you look at my window, notice how we have uh, kind of like what we're currently doing. And then we have reset space A, D, and the different toggling for the different sorts. So I want to actually draw that onto the screen and then we'll implement the sorting algorithm. So to do that, we need to set up a font. So whenever you want to draw something in Pi game, you need a font. Uh, and you get that by using the follow. Do something like font is equal to pi game dot font dot s y s font. Then you need to give it a uh, actual font. So I'm going to say Comic Sans. There's a bunch of options here, but Comic Sans is just always the one that I use. Then you need to give it a size. For now, I'll go with 30. Now this is going to be my regular font. I also want to have a large font. 
and the large font is going to have a size of 40. Okay, so there we go. I've just defined the fonts on draw information so we can access them any place that we're drawn. Perfect. So now let's go to draw and let's actually implement kind of the control text. So whenever I want to show text on the screen, what I need to do is use a font to render a text kind of surface or object or painting or whatever. And then I put that onto my window. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say controls is equal to and then this is going to be uh, draw info, draw underscore info dot font and then dot render. And then I'm going to put what I want to render. So let me actually just copy this in so I don't mess it up. OK, let's grab it from my other screen. So this is going to be R is reset and then I have the pipe and then space is start sorting. A is ascending and D is descending. I'm going to put a one. This is the anti aliasing. Just make this one. It's essentially like the sharpness of the lines. So always make the middle parameter one here and then the color. And in this case, I just want it to be black. So I'm going to say draw info dot black. Of course, you could hard code in black as well, but we'll just go with that to make it more readable. OK, so now that we've actually rendered the font, let me see if I can just let you guys see this. So it's still on the screen here for a second. What I need to do is actually display this on the screen and I want to display this perfectly in the center. So I'll show you how to do that. So to draw, uh, I guess, text onto the screen, you do draw info dot window you need to access your window. Then you're going to use dot blit. Blit will just take a surface and blit it onto another screen. So that's what we're doing here. I'm going to pass the surface, which is controls that I want to actually blit. And then I pass the X, Y coordinate where I want to display it. Now, the Y coordinate I can just manually set as like 10 or something like five. So it's very close to the top of the screen. But for the X coordinate, since I want it perfectly centered, I need to do some kind of math to figure that out. So I'll show you uh, what the math looks like. I'm just going to open up paint. So let's go paint like that and we can see what it looks like. Okay, so let's say I have a window that looks like this and I have some text and I want it perfectly in the center of the screen. Well, I have the width of the window, which is like W, right? And then I have the width of my text. Let's just call this T, okay? So the way that I actually determine where this coordinate is, because that's what I want to determine, right? I need the top left hand corner of the text because then it will draw going from the right of the top left hand corner. The way I determine this is I start by saying, okay, well, the middle of the screen is right here. That is W over two. Now I'm just using my mouse, so please excuse the massive discrepancy in font size, but W over two is the middle of the screen. Now that's fine. If my text was say one pixel, I could just draw it right here. However, if I start drawing my text right here, then it's going to go off the screen. It's not going to be center. So what I now need to do is take T over two. So the uh, what is it width of the text? And then if I take the width over two and I subtract it from the text over two, that actually gives me this coordinate right here. So hopefully that makes sense. But if you see that we have a width of let's get rid of all this. If this is half the width of the text, right, that's how much further to the left from the middle of the screen I need to go to draw the text perfectly in the middle of the screen. That's really the best explanation I can give. Uh, that is how you draw it perfectly in the middle of the screen. That's what I'm going to implement now. Now you could do the same thing with the Y if you wanted to, but I don't want this in the middle on the Y coordinate. I only want it in the middle for the X coordinate. OK, so let's now do this. We're going to say the uh, not game info, the draw info dot width over two subtracted by the controls dot get underscore width over two. So this is a useful method you can use on any of your text objects. Just do controls or whatever the name of it is dot get width and then you can divide it by two like I did. So this will put it perfectly in the middle of the screen. And then if you change what's in here, it will automatically adjust. OK, great. So that's controls. Now underneath that, I want to have, I guess, sorting. So sorting is to like change the sorting algorithm that we're going to use. So we'll just copy this one in as well. So we're going to have uh, I for insertion sort and B for bubble sort. Now we haven't implemented those yet because we don't yet have the sorting algorithm, but that's what I can do. And then when I draw this, all I have to do here is change a few things. So I'll just say sorting. And then rather than drawing it at five, I'm going to draw it at 35. So it's 30 pixels below. Uh, the controls right here. OK, so that's all I need for drawing the text on the screen to draw what we're currently sorting. I'll do that in a second because we don't yet have the sorting algorithms. But let me run this code and let's see what we're getting so far.
OK, perfect. There we go. So we have R reset, space start sorting, A ascending, D descending, uh, I insertion sort, B bubble sort. Perfect. That looks good to me. Really, the last step now is implementing the sorting algorithms. All right, so now we can go ahead and implement these sorting algorithms. Now, I'm not really going to be discussing the logic behind these different sorting algorithms. There is all kinds of videos and tutorials on the Internet talking about how these work. I'm just going to code them out relatively quickly, uh, and then I will show you how we can make it so we draw the steps. So let's write a function. I guess we can do it right above main and let's call this bubble underscore sort. Now, for any of our sorting functions, if we want them to work with our code, what we need them to take in here is draw info and then ascending. And I'm just going to have a default value equal to true. So I'm going to make it so the bubble sort and the insertion sort can sort either in ascending or descending order because we have that as kind of a parameter for our sorting algorithm visualizer. Anyways, for the bubble sort, I'm going to say that my LST is equal to draw info dot LST, just so I don't have to write out draw info a bunch of times. And then I'm going to say for I in range, and this is going to be the len of LST minus one. And then I'm going to say for J in range, and this is going to be the len of LST minus one minus I. Now we could do it in the other order as well, but this will be fine for now. And then I'm going to say num one is equal to LST at and this will be J and then num two is equal to LST at J plus one. OK, uh, and now we're going to compare the values. So I'm going to say if num one is let me look at my cheat sheet here greater than num two and ascending. So we're going in ascending order. Then I want to swap these values. So I'm going to say LST at J LST at J plus one is equal to the reverse. So LST at J plus one and LST at J. This is how you can swap in one line without a temporary variable in Python. This will just swap the values in the array. And then after this, I want to draw the list again. OK, so I'm going to talk about how we can do this in a second. Uh, for now, I'll just leave this commented out, but this should work to actually sort the list. And then I'm going to do something that's going to look a little bit weird but I'm going to yield true. Now I'm going to discuss why we need this in a second. But finally, at the end of the algorithm, I will return LST. And now all I want to do is make it so this can sort in descending order as well. So it's going to look a little bit strange, but I'm going to put this. I'm going to say if num1 is greater than num2 and ascending, or if num1 is less than num2 and not ascending, so this is essentially checking the descending case, uh, then we will still do the same thing. So if we are ascending and number one is greater than number two, then let's swap them. If we're sorting in descending order, so not ascending, then if num one is less than num two, then we can swap them. Now, let me make sure that condition is correct. I believe it is awesome. Now, let's talk about this yield keyword. So the reason why I'm yielding here is because what I want to do is call this function for each kind of swap. So I want to call this function every time I want to swap to occur. So rather than having this go through and run the entire algorithm, I want it to perform a swap and then yield control back to wherever it was called from and wait to be called again until it's going to perform the next step. Now, this is called a generator. This is going to work similar to an iterator like you might have for a for loop. And again, what this lets you do is pause the execution of the function kind of halfway through and then resume it from whatever this yield keyword um, came from. So yield is obviously different than return. Yield is going to pause but store the current state of the function. So that means the next time I call this generator to run, it's going to uh, run, sorry, starting at wherever it yielded from last time. So theoretically, I can yield anything that I want. I'm just yielding true because that probably makes the most sense. But I just want to have the yield keyword so that I can stop the function and then resume it. And again, you'll see why I want that in a second. But essentially, this is going to allow me to be able to continue to use the controls like reset, um, exit out of the screen, all of the other buttons, because if I don't yield, then this function is going to have control the entire time it's doing the sorting. And I'm not going to be able to press any other buttons on my keyboard. The program can't respond to anything else if this is uh, not yielding. OK, so now let's talk about the drawing aspect. So the reason I pass draw info here is one, because we need LST, but two, because in this function itself, I'm going to manually draw the um, the blocks or the list that's being sorted. Now, what I want to do is I want to redraw the entire list on the screen, but I want to cover the two things that I'm swapping. So I want to cover J and J plus one in red and in green. 
Now you can put them in whatever color you want, uh, but that's what I want to do. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to go to draw list and I'm going to add one more uh, parameter here, which is going to be color positions like that. Now, this is going to be equal to a dictionary and I'm going to pass in a dictionary of indices and then have that correspond with different colors that I want to make them when I draw. Them. So you'll see how this works again in a second. I know I keep saying that, but I can't explain all of it at one time. Uh, what I'm going to do here, though, is I'm going to say if and then we're going to say I in and then this will be color underscore positions, then color is going to be equal to color positions at I. Pretty simple. This will be a dictionary. The index will map to a color and then we will just manually override the color that we set here to either, I guess, green or red, depending on the color that we are drawing. Uh, we'll do something else as well inside of here, which is actually going to be clearing the portion of the screen where the list is being shown. So right now what we have is inside of our draw, we draw the list after we draw all of this stuff and after we fill the window. So that means we're not seeing double or anything because we're filling the window then we are drawing the list. Now, from my bubble sort function here, I could theoretically just call this draw function and everything would work fine. However, that's not super efficient because I don't need to be re-rendering this text every single frame when this is going to be static, right? This text is going to stay the exact same. So instead of kind of redrawing the entire window, what I want to do is just draw the list. So what I'm going to do here is implement something that's going to clear just the portion of the screen where this list is being drawn and then redraw the list over top of it again. So I'm not redrawing all of this stuff. I'm just redrawing the list every frame. OK, so let's do that. I'm going to add a parameter here called clear underscore background and make this equal to false by default. Now, if this is true, we're just going to override this portion of the screen. So I'm going to say if clear underscore BG then the clear rectangle is going to be equal to and I now need to calculate kind of the rectangle on the screen that I want to clear the position for. So remember, we are drawing our list in uh, kind of a certain section of the screen, right? We're going to be drawing it a few pixels padded from the left and from the right and a few pixels padded downwards. So that's kind of the rectangle I want to generate here. So that's what I'm going to try to come up with. Now, I'm just going to look at my cheat sheet because this is not uh, simple to do on the top of my head. But I believe what we want here is draw info dot side pad divided by two. The reason we want it divided by two is because the starting X coordinate is going to be half of the side pad for when we're drawing our list. Then I want this to be draw info dot. And this is going to be the top pad because this is where we'll actually start drawing the list from the vertical position from the Y coordinate. And then after this, I need to calculate the width and the height. Now, the width is simply going to be draw info dot width minus draw info dot side pad. This will subtract the left and the right hand side pad. So this is correct. And then I want the draw info dot height. And this is going to be subtracted by draw info dot top pad. Although, again, it doesn't really matter if we subtract this or not, because theoretically, if I just draw the entire height, since we're drawing downwards, any extra rectangle I draw will just be off the screen and we won't see it. So I'll leave this in for now just to show you that this does work. Uh, we don't really need to actually implement the top pad. Now, let's put this on a second line just so it's a little bit easier to see. And hopefully you can read all of that. OK, great. Actually, let me zoom out a bit and maybe this makes it a little bit easier. OK, so now that we've done that, what I want to do is actually draw the rectangle. So I just came up with a rectangle just because it's easier to put it in a variable first. But now I'm going to say pie game dot draw dot rect. And I'm going to draw this on the draw info dot window. The color will be the draw info dot background color. And then I'm just going to draw this at the rectangle. So rather than putting all of this stuff inside of here, I just put the variable, which is actually called clear rect. Perfect. Now, since I'm doing that at the bottom here, I also need to say if clear background, then pi game dot display dot update, because I'm not going to be updating in here. Uh, usually because we update right here after we draw the list. So if we are calling this directly, so we pass clear background equal true, then we need to make sure we update the screen as well. All right, so I think that's it for draw list. Hopefully that all makes sense. Now let's go back to bubble sort and let's actually call draw list and pass kind of these new parameters now. So when I call draw list, I'm going to pass a draw info because we are going to be redrawing the entire list. Then what I'm going to pass is color positions. Now, for color positions, all I'm going to do is say J 
is going to correspond with draw info. And then this will be dot green. And then I'm going to say J plus one is going to correspond with draw info dot red. Now feel free to change these colors to whatever you like. I'm just using green and red and you could swap the order too. you could have J be uh, red and J plus one be green. I'm not really using them to indicate anything specific. I'm just showing the two elements that I'm swapping at this step. Great. Then I'm yielding true. OK, so now we have the bubble sort algorithm done. Now insertion sort will be pretty simple. Uh, but let's first see if this is actually going to work and call the bubble sort algorithm. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a variable and I'm going to call this sorting underscore algorithm. And this is going to store the function that's going to represent the current sorting algorithm that we have. So in this case, I'm going to call it bubble sort. I'm going to use bubble sort, but we would change this function to be insertion sort, merge sort, whatever other sort we're using, if that's what we wanted to do. Now, I'm trying to write this in a very flexible way so that all you have to do is write another function that takes in draw info and ascending. And obviously, it will have to be tweaked a little bit depending on the sort. But all you'll have to do is literally just put the name of the function right here, and then that will change the sorting algorithm that's being used for the visualization. OK, so we're going to say sorting algorithm is equal to bubble sort. I'm going to say sorting algo name is equal to and we're just going to hard code this in as bubble sort just so we can display this on the screen. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to go to where we start the sorting. So it'll be right here. And I'm going to say that my sorting algorithm. Uh, actually, this is going to be a little bit tricky here. Uh, OK, so I just made a cut there because I had to think about something for a second. I actually want to add one more variable here, which is going to be sorting algorithm generator, because we're going to use the generator to actually generate or perform the sorting algorithm. This is just going to represent what sorting algorithm we want. OK, so let's now go here and we're going to say that the sorting algorithm underscore generator is equal to and this is going to be the sorting algorithm that we chose and then we're going to call this function and we're going to pass to it draw info and ascending okay so remember we have this ascending variable here this is going to be equal to true by default but we can toggle it to be false and so if we make it false then we'll pass false for ascending and so we'll sort in the other order now what's going on here is we're creating a variable sorting algorithm generator, which is going to store the generator object that will be created when we call this function. So this is something about generators. As soon as you put a yield keyword, it makes a function a generator, which means when you call it the first time you call it, it actually returns to a generator object. So it's not going to return to me LST. It's not actually going to run any of this code. It's going to give me a generator. And then for me to actually use that generator, I need to manually call the next method on it or iterate over it. So this isn't meant to be an entire lesson on generators. I do actually have a video on my channel. I'll put it up on the screen. It's generators explained in Python. In case this is very confusing, you can go through that. You could also check out programming expert. We have an entire lesson on that as well. Whole point, though, again, is that when you call a generator, it gives you a generator object. Generator object has this next function on it. The next function gives you the next thing to be yielded from the generator. So the first time we call next, it's going to yield true and it's going to perform all of the steps up until this first yield. The next time we call next, it's going to continue running until it hits the yield again. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. But if I had a generator like define gen and then I yielded one and I yielded two, when I call my next method, I know I'm spelling this incorrectly. The first time I call it, this is going to give me one. The next time I call it, this is going to give me two. So I would say something like gen is equal to gen, or maybe we go G is equal to gen. And then I would call next on G that would give me one. And then I would call next on G again, that would give me two. And then if I try to call it one more time, what it's going to give me is a stop iteration exception. If I can. OK, you guys get the point. I can't type properly today, but stop iteration. So it's going to raise an exception and tell me that, hey, there's no more elements to be yielded. And so we're raising an exception to tell you the generator is done. Hopefully that was like a mini little lesson on generators, but let's continue now. So now that we have actually created the generator object, I want to put something at the top of my while loop here and I want to say if sorting. So if we are currently sorting, then what we want to do is try to call the next method on our generator. So we're going to say try and oops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> I'm going to say try and then this is going to be next on. 
and what is it called? Our sorting algorithm generator right here. And then I'm going to accept the stop iteration exception. And I'm simply going to say sorting like this is equal to false. OK, and then otherwise I will just normally draw. So let's explain this here. Why is this? My autocomplete is just being annoying right now. Draw tab. OK, there we go. So what I just did here, understand this is a bit confusing, is I said if we are currently sorting, then what I'm going to do is try to call this next method. Now, if this doesn't work, which essentially means the generator is done, I'm going to raise or I'm going to accept the stop iteration exception and I'm going to set sorting equal to false because that would mean, OK, the generator is finished. Now, if it's not, we're just going to keep calling this constantly until we finish sorting the list. Once we're done sorting the list, stop iteration is raised. We then accept that we say sorting is equal to false and then we could sort a different list or reset it or do whatever we want. But I'm just calling next on sorting algorithm generator, which we initialize right here when we start sorting. And the way we do that is by using the sorting algorithm variable which I put right here, which is equal to bubble sort. So bubble sort is the name of the generator function. We call bubble sort, gives us the generator object. We then call next a bunch of times, and hopefully by now you get the point. So at this point, we can try this out and we can see if this is going to work or not. I have a feeling we'll get a few bugs, but let's try it and see. OK, so I am just going, going to hit space and I see that nothing is happening currently. Uh, I hit space, nothing is happening, and I believe that may be because we're not actually. Oh, OK, so it did sort, but it wasn't showing me any updates on the screen. That's a little bit strange. Let me have a look here and then I will be right back. All right, so I found the error. I'm sure many of you probably saw this, but I forgot to pass my other attribute or other parameter here true. So if I go to draw list, we have clear background equal to false by default. I wasn't passing true, so we weren't actually clearing the background and seeing the updates on the screen. So now if I pass true, we should see that because it looked like it did sort the list. It just wasn't showing us the live progress. So let's try this now. Let's run the code. OK, and let's hit space and notice it's showing this to us. Now we're getting a bit of red at the top. The reason for that is that my background, uh, I guess I must have drawn it in the wrong location. So we'll fix that in a second. But you can see that it is actually giving us the visualization. And there we go. That looks pretty good. So let's try to fix this now because it looks like I messed this up. So let's go to where are we? Draw list. OK, so I'm drawing uh, the top Y coordinate at draw info dot top pad, but it looks like we're drawing, I guess, the uh, the rectangles above the top pad for some reason. That's a little bit strange to me why the rectangles would be drawing above the top pad. I just want to see in my other code here what I would have put for this and why this isn't working. So let me have a look and I'll be right back. All right, so I've just found the fix. My apologies for this, guys, but this happens when we're recording hour long videos. Anyways, I have a self adopt block height here. And previously, I had round. Now, when I round this, what ends up happening is that I'm going to have a bunch of pixels kind of being larger than I want them to be because of the fact that I'm going to round values up. Now, I understand this is a little bit weird to comprehend, but let's say that block height before rounding is something like 4.55 pixels, meaning for every kind of one unit I have, I want to draw that at 4.55 pixels high. So now imagine I have 100 units that I want to draw at 4.55. Well, if I round this value up to five, that's going to give me an additional, say, 20 pixels or something like that that I'm drawing additionally, which is going to be going into my self dot top pad because I round it up. So I'm getting kind of a rounding precision error. So what I want to do instead of rounding is I just want to math dot floor this which is going to put this down automatically. So even if I'm at like 4.99, it's just going to round it directly to the floor to make sure I'm never going to be above this top pad. There might be a better solution to this, but I think math.floor is the easiest. So we're just going to go with that because it will still make the scaling correct for all of our values. We just won't be utilizing as much space as possible in some situations, which is fine. So I'm just going to say math.floor. However, that means we need to import math. So make sure you import math at the top of the program. Now, that should be the fix. I think that should be good. So let's run this here and let's test out our code because we're pretty much almost done. So I'm going to hit space. Looks like everything is working fine. And yeah, that is uh, looks great to me. Now, I'll show you how to speed this up in one second. But for now, this is a pretty good speed. And you can see that we sort this successfully. So let's reset using R. 
let's change this to descending. We'll have to add our title to tell us what algorithm and if we're ascending or descending. We'll do that in a minute. But now let's run this and we should be getting it in the opposite order because I toggled this to descending instead of ascending. Perfect. That looks good to me. Nice and quick sort, although not really considering we're using bubble sort. But yeah, looks good. Awesome. So let's reset. And yeah, looking good. OK, so now what we will do is we will add the title telling us what sorting algorithm we have if we're ascending or descending. And there was something else that I wanted to do uh, that I forgot about. Uh, I wanted to show you how to speed this up. Yes. OK, so if you want to speed this up, just change your clock dot tick here to be a higher number. So watch what happens if I make this 120 now. And you will see that we should go a lot faster. Yeah. So when I hit space, you can see we're going significantly faster than we were before. And if you want this to go at the maximum possible speed, then just remove the clock tick. Now, for some of you, even when you increase the clock tick to a large number, it's not going to go any faster. That's because you're being limited by the speed of your processor. In this case, I have a pretty fast processor, so this is running quickly. But if you're on an older computer, you may notice this happens significantly slower than what's happening here. OK, so let's add the title now. In order to add the title, I need to pass a few more things to draw. So when I draw here, I need to pass the algo underscore name and then ascending as well, telling me if we are ascending or not ascending. So let's now pass those values when we call the draw function. So let's go to draw and let's pass the sorting algorithm name. OK, and ascending. Perfect. So now we can go inside of here and what we're going to do is just render some text and display that information. So I actually want to render this above my controls and my sorting. So what I'm going to do is now put these a bit lower. I'm going to draw this at 35 and I'm going to draw this at 65 and then the other text that we draw, I'll just draw at five. OK, so now we are going to have instead of controls, this is going to be, I guess, title titles fine for now. Uh, we then want to blit the title. Again, we want this in the middle of the screen, so we're going to put this to title. But what we actually want for the title is going to be different. I'm going to put an F string here, and I'm just going to put inside of curly braces the algo name. And then this is going to be a little bit weird if you haven't seen this, but I'm going to write an if statement that writes ascending if we're ascending and writes descending if we're not ascending. So I'm going to say ascending. Make sure you're using single quotation marks, by the way. If you use double, then you're going to get an error because we surrounded the F string with double quotation marks. But I'm going to say ascending if, and then this will be ascending, else this will be descending. Perfect. I think that's pretty intuitive to understand what's going on there, but that's what we have. And that looks good. Now, the F string is only in Python version 3.6 or above. So if you're using a lower version, then this may not work for you. In that case, you can just use a string concatenation. If you're familiar with Python, that should be relatively simple to uh, to replace. OK, so let's try this now and let's see if the title is showing up. OK, so bubble sort ascending. Nice. Now, I want this to be a bit bigger, so I'm going to use rather than the font, the oops, not there, the large font that I declared earlier. So again, remember here we have large font, just 10 pixels larger. And then rather than drawing this in black, I'm just going to draw this in green just so it stands out. OK, let's try this now. OK, looks good. We might want to move the controls down a little bit, so let's do that. Let's make this at 45 and this at 75. OK, let's run this. And there we go. That looks good to me. So now let's see if I change this to descending. OK, we can see the text is updating. And now all we need to do is implement insertion sort because, as we can see, our sorting algorithm is visualizing, is working properly. OK, so let's now do insertion sort. So insertion sort I do not have memorized, so I'm going to have to look at my other screen. So please excuse me while I do this, but let's set this up. So I'm going to say define insertion underscore sort. Just like bubble sort, we need to take in the draw info and the ascending. Make this by default equal to true. Then what I will do is say LST is equal to just like before draw info dot LST and I will set up a for loop. So for I in range, this will be one and then the len of LST. Then I'm going to say that current is equal to LST at index I. I'm going to say while true and then I'm going to write the two conditions for if this loop should let me swap something based on if I'm sorting in ascending order or descending order. So I'm going to say ascending underscore sort is equal to I greater than zero 
and LST at I minus one is greater than current and ascending. Understand that's a lot there, but we're going to copy this now and do it again. And I'm going to say descending sort this time. OK, descending sort. This time it's going to be I greater than zero. And we're just going to swap this sign and say not ascending. So these are kind of my two conditions for if I should be continuing in this while loop. If you're not familiar with insertion sort, again, watch a tutorial on it or something. I'm not going to explain it in this video. But the point is, if we're ascending, then this is the condition. And if we're descending, then this is the condition. And I'm just writing them in variables. So it's easier when I do this next check. So I'm going to say if not, and then this is going to be ascending sort or not descending sort. Uh, sorry, this is going to be and not descending sort. Then I want to break. Otherwise, though, I'm going to do a bunch of swaps. So I'm just checking if either of these conditions are not true. If one of them is true, I will continue. If both of them are not true, then I don't need to do any swaps. So I break. OK, so I'm going to say LST at I is equal to LST at I minus one. I'm going to say I is equal to I minus one. I'm going to say LST at I is equal to current. Uh, that's the variable we have defined right here. And then I'm going to say draw LST because we've just done our swaps and I'm going to pass draw info. I'm going to pass I and then this will be draw info dot green. And then we will pass I minus one and this will be draw info dot and then red. OK, then we need to pass true. And I think after we yield true here, and we finally return LST, we should be good. Now, I understand I just kind of speed coded that out. So I'll walk through this quickly. We have our list. We have our for loop. Current is equal to LST at I. And then while either of these two conditions is true, based on if we're sorting in ascending or descending order, we're going to perform the swaps. So we're going to say LST at index I is equal to LST at I minus 1. I is then equal to I minus 1. So we're actually modifying this iterator variable right here. And then we're saying LST at I, which we just changed here, is equal to current, which is this value. So just moving it in the list. Then we've performed swaps here. So the two values that I want to highlight is I and I minus one. Now this needs to be in capitals. My apologies. I'm going to do this in the other order. I'm going to say I minus one and then I like that just to be consistent with what we did here. OK, then I'm yielding true. The reason I'm yielding true is because I just did a swap. So every time you do a single swap, you should yield just so that you give control back to the main loop so that you can then press a button, reset, pause, whatever it is that you need to do. OK, so now we have insertion sort. Uh, I think this is just good to go. So let's now look at how we can swap between the two. So what I'm going to do is add some buttons here, one that is for I insertion sort and then B for bubble sort. So let's copy this. Let's paste this in twice. And rather than pygame underscore D, this is going to be I. I don't care if I'm sorting or not. Actually, maybe we won't let them swap it if they're still sorting. So we'll leave that in. And then if they hit I, then what I'm going to do is say that the sorting underscore algorithm is equal to insertion sort. And then we'll just change the algo name. So sorting algo name. OK, and then the name will be insertion sort like that. OK, nice. Now let's copy these into here. Let's change this key to be B. And then, of course, we just need to adjust this so that this is now going to be bubble sort. So bubble sort like that. And then this will be bubble sort. OK, that's actually all we need to do, because now we will just change this uh, function that we're using for the sorting algorithm and the sorting algorithm name. Everything else will automatically be handled for us. And just like I was talking about before, all you need to do to implement another sorting algorithm here is write a function that acts as a generator. So you just need a yield keyword whenever you want to draw something. Make sure you take in draw info and ascending. And then you should pretty much be good so long as you're calling draw list at the appropriate time in that sorting function. Now, this has to happen in place. If you're not doing this in place, then you're going to have to kind of come up with a different visualization technique because this is only going to work for in place sorting algorithms. Anyways, let's run this now and see if this works to toggle the different algorithms. So I'm going to click B. Uh, I'm going to click I. Now we're in insertion sort ascending. Let's change it to descending and let's run this. Uh, this looks different than bubble sort, I think. Uh, yeah, it looks like insertion sort to me, but let me just confirm and we'll run bubble sort and see if we get it differently. Okay, so let's reset. 
Let's go to bubble sort and let's run this. Okay, perfect. So bubble sort is working differently than insertion sort, which is what I expected. Awesome. So I think with that said, that is going to wrap up this video. Hopefully this gave you a good kind of platform to build a sorting algorithm visualizer. There is a few optimizations that could be performed here. Not everything is completely perfect, but I think for a YouTube tutorial and again, giving you kind of a foundation and base, this is a really good starting point. If you guys have any recommendations for how to improve this, please leave a comment down below. It's unlikely I'll make another video on this, but you could help someone else out, which is always appreciated. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like. Make sure to check out Programming Expert from the link in the description. Use code TIM for a discount, and I will see you in another YouTube video.